Hello and welcome back to another video. Now today's video is going to be um, slightly different, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan and it's not going to be a vlog because I'm going to put the camera down and I'm going to sit and chat um, with the camera, um, but it's kind of going to be like a constant update on my reading progress. Um, and I think at the end of the video what will have been achieved is a review during the process of reading, which I guess is a vlog. We'll see how it turns out, um, basically. Anyway, this book, um, this book has kind of been doing the rounds on Instagram, on YouTube, in the general bookish ecumen. This is the sort of books that we're going to be seeing, I think, more of in the wake of Sally Rooney's popularity. Um, it's that sort of millennial fiction that's about white middle-class girls drifting through life, I guess. <laughs> but I do, however, want to read this because this book is set in Hong Kong. It's the experience of um, an Irish girl who goes and moves to live in Hong Kong for a year and teaches English. Um, and I've been looking for a book for that experience because I did something similar. I went to Hong Kong. I was there for three and a half years um, and I was teaching English for the whole time. I can already tell by the synopsis that perhaps this isn't going to be very similar to my experience, um, but I do want to go into it with an open mind because I do want to see that experience of uh, a Western writer writing about their time teaching in Hong Kong. Um, I don't expect it to sort of speak of my experience. I think Hong Kong's a very big, very diverse place with lots of different experiences, but I thought it'd be interesting for me and for you to read this and kind of look at it through uh, a way of telling my story via this book's story. So that's going to be the shape of this video. I have no idea yet how this is going to turn out or pan out or how I'm going to find this book. Um, hopefully it beats my expectations. So let's start reading and I'll catch up with you when I next get to an exciting point. So it's been about maybe like an hour or two since um, I made the first video and I'm about 60 pages into the book now. She's got an Irish character, well of course the author is Irish, um, so the Irish ca character um, spends a lot of time talking about herself um, and spends a lot of time noticing people's educations, particularly English people's educations and sort of their environments and the language that they use, where at the same time this Irish character is sort of utilising a language system that d doesn't quite match up with the things that she's complaining about. about. Um, and that kind of really bothers me. It becomes disingenuous because you have a character complaining about English people using shall instead of will or something like that. Um, and yet this character is in this constant cycle of using uh, words that aren't naturally conversational. Um, the one good thing I'm finding about this book so far is that I remember reading that the author is on the autistic spectrum, and I feel that that really comes across in this book. Um, the character ne doesn't necessarily also feel on the spectrum, but the way it's written is very blunt and to the point, and actually has a very interesting perspective, particularly on how um, the character notices uh, people's reactions around them, and um, that kind of, and I find that very interesting because it's a perspective that you perhaps don't often get in literature, and um, so I'm enjoying that. I cannot give any tidbits about my life in Hong Kong from this book because she, she doesn't talk about it. She, it's, just, uh, it's just a backdrop to, um, to a very self-absorbed storyline, which self-absorption is something I can't really get behind because I, I, I much prefer enjoying books that uh, characters engage with the space and the location and particularly nature and things. Um, but here it's just engaging with her own mind and I cannot deal with the masturbatory nature of that. Um, one thing I guess is the character is vegetarian in Hong Kong. I was also vegetarian in Hong Kong, although I did have to start eating fish because being vegetarian in Hong Kong is really hard. There's meat in most things um, and even um, a lot of the sauces and stocks that they will use in the vegetarian options have meat in so it becomes difficult. So therefore if you eat seafood it becomes slightly easier to actually be able to sustain a diet because the vegetarian options in Hong Kong would be in um, Buddhist restaurants. You have to go to specific Buddhist restaurants or you would go to the Western vegetarian restaurants but then they're a lot more expensive. Um, and since I didn't have kitchens in my first two flats that I lived in, um, I had to eat out every night, and the character makes it out as if 
uh, getting takeaways in Hong Kong is like some sort of rich person's thing. It's not. Everybody does it. It's Hong Kong. Hong Kong houses have such small kitchens because it's so affordable to um, eat out, uh, and uh, it kind of is the same price to eat out every night as it is to do food shopping and to cook at home. There's no real difference. Um, but unless, like, I think the main character is living in central, the most expensive part, where there are a lot of Western restaurants and high, high-end, expensive restaurants. So I guess in that sense, it, it it's logical for the characters to be like, oh, the rich side. But um, but yeah, it's uh, that's something that I definitely struggled with being vegetarian in Hong Kong. So I'm gonna have some dinner now, and then I'll probably read some more before I go to bed. And then I think I probably won't update to you until tomorrow, possibly tomorrow morning when I wake up. I'll see you then. So it's the next day. Um, I read some more last night before I went to bed, and then I've just been reading some whilst I had my morning cup of tea. Um, and I'm about halfway through now. Again, there's really nothing to say because she doesn't really talk about actually being in Hong Kong. It's just so focused on these two sort of love interests and her and the character's own mind. And that's kind of really bothering me because... <laughs> because I don't care enough for any of the characters. They, none of them seem fleshed out in any way. Um, they're all just very basic and shallow, and the book is so shallow because it, it tells you everything. Everything that you need to know is told very directly. There's no subtext. There's nothing that um, makes you kind of question motives or whatever. It's the main character is narrating every single thing and the author, whenever the author wants you to know something, uh, the character says it very explicitly. And I'm beginning to feel quite annoyed because so far, of all the places, when, when the character does leave the flat and go to places in Hong Kong and we get to see the names of the places, every place that's been mentioned is within sort of three um, underground metro station stops of each other. There's there's very little movement. She's not going far. And there was one point when she was in the um she was in one place with her with, with the guy that she was having sex with and then they were going to somewhere else um which was actually fairly nearby and she talked about getting the train there, which wouldn't make sense because it seems like it would be a longer walk to the train station um, then it would just go straight to the place. But whatever, um, obviously the characters needed a moment to talk and perhaps on the train seemed like the better uh, place. Um, but yeah, it's kind of frustrating because it makes Hong Kong seem so small. And then of course the main character is complaining about, um, you know, not having that much money and not getting paid enough and all of this. When I can tell you straight off the bat, the minimum that this character is probably earning is going to be like, £1,800 a month, and that's the minimum. It's most likely that she's earning about £2,000 a month. And she's not paying any rent, because she's living in this very nice flat in Central. She's not spending really much money on anything else, and yet she's talking about how, you know, she'll never be able to save any money. And I'm like, yeah, I can tell you're saving quite a lot of money. That kind of really bothers me, because it it's almost like the author is uh, manipulating reality. And let, but then again, maybe the author thinks that that's actually not a decent amount of money for survivorship, um, which probably again shows the author's position in life that uh, bothers me. Um, but you know, it just, just nothing's really kind of making sense. Anyway, I'm going to do some work now and then I'll probably read some more in the afternoon. Um, and maybe update to you later today. We'll see. So I think it's been like two or three days since I last updated um, the video, and I haven't, the reason is because I haven't done any reading since then. Um, I have been a little bit busy within that time, but more than anything, I just haven't really wanted to pick up the book. Anyway, this morning, I, with my morning tea, I took some time to read the book. Um, and I'm, I think I've got like 70 pages left, so I can probably finish this today. Um, I've just reached the final part of the book, which is Edith and Julian. There's nothing much more to say about this book in relation to Hong Kong, because it just... It does... I don't see the point of it being set in Hong Kong. It literally could just be set anywhere, and it wouldn't... It would be the exact same story. Nothing would change. In this, in Edith's part, um, Arva, the main character, has started to meet um, some more Hong Kongers. But they're all... 
highly educated, taught, uh, been to university in the UK or the US, went to private school in the UK and everything. Um, and they all seem to have, or they all seem to express the exact same um, ideals that Ava, the main character, has, which just doesn't really make any sense. And nor does it actually work for them to say it given their backgrounds. Especially when one of them was just like, uh, where she said that she was teaching English and the other one was like, oh, how does it feel to um, to be part of the neo-colonization? Um, and then like, you know, the, uh, the Ava was like, oh, but nobody else will take me. And, uh, but it's just like, that doesn't quite work nor make sense given that they are also a part of it through through the process that they've gone through. But I think Hong Kong has a far greater concern of neocolonization from mainland China as opposed to from the English language. Things like that just don't make sense and it's just like the author is trying to, you know, um, put in her political messaging um, without really thinking about it or without kind of um, balancing it to make it feel real. Um, so these things just crop up as and when the author wants them to. And um, when, when the author feels like she has something to say, she's just like, oh, okay, let's quickly put in this political messaging so people can know how staunchly liberal I am, um, which just winds me up because it's not, it's not natural, it doesn't flow, and oftentimes it's wrong. <laughs> At least in my opinion it's wrong. Obviously to her it's uh, it's her opinion and she thinks that it's right. But it's quite sad if she's so bullheaded about her opinion being some sort of divine truth. I don't like the way that they treat um, Julian the guy. Because the author really wants him to be um, like the bad guy. So then every single character mentions how horrible he is or how he's not nice and everything. But he's, he's, uh, he's a person. He's a person just living the life that he wants to live, just the same way that everybody else is living the life that they want to live. Just because the girls have a normative idea about what men are um, and what they should be, but then because he's not exactly um, doing what they feel like he needs to be doing in relation to them, they're making out as if he's bad, but actually no, he's just a fucking person living his life, how he wants to live it, and just because it's not the way the main character wants him to live it, yeah, she's the one that benefits from it all. It just, it's just so frustrating because it's really narrow-minded, and I think it's really trying to not be narrow-minded. Um, the messaging that it's sending across is like, ah, oh, um, I'm part of this new wave of radical thinkers, and uh, um, I, I want to live this sort of free, fluid lifestyle. Um, but nobody else can do that, of course, unless they're a girl, because girls can do it, but uh, boys can't. It's, I don't know, just shit like that really winds me up. So we'll see how quick it takes me to finish this book, um, and I'll update you when I do finish it. It'll probably be later this evening. What time? <laughs> Who knows what time it is? It's, I believe it's the early evening, late afternoon. Um, and I've just finished reading Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan. Um, I gave this book a three stars in the end. Actually, the ending, I think, redeemed itself a little bit because Ava, the main character, did finally have a moment of self-reflection. Albeit um, a moment of self-reflection in which she's telling us very explicitly what we need to think that she's doing. Rather than it actually being sort of showcased in everything she had done before um, and us engaging and understanding why she was doing things. It was just like, okay, here's, all, here's everything she's done. And then here at the end of the novel, here's a moment when, when we're going to now tell you what it is that she's done and why. Like that, that, which kind of bothers me because I'm just like, if you had done it well in the first place, you wouldn't have needed this moment of self-reflection because we would know we, we would understand, you know, it's something that needs to be sort of woven into the story, not just kind of piled on at the end. It was, the writing was just very meh all the way through. It was quick and it was easy. There were moments when um, it was blunt and to the point, which I think was very interesting to engage with a different perspective on how to read other people and to read yourself within context of other people. That part I liked in the writing. What I didn't like about the writing was how, um, political ideals were just shoehorned in, randomly. And then there were moments when um, the main character who's teaching English 
sort of had a commentary about the English language and the way it was structured and whatnot, which then was sort of uh, shown in contrast to her and her as an Irish person who had been denied her sort of Irish language heritage um, and then subsequently speaking a wrong kind of English. Those moments were like, I think, the most manipulative moments um, on the author's behalf to portray a point because it was just too much like a hitting something over the head consistently um, and being like, have you got it yet? When, yes, we got it the first time. You don't have to keep going. <laughs> um, so that kind of, those moments really frustrated me, especially because it, it, um, it doesn't quite make sense. And sometimes she makes assumptions, which I feel are, are wrong. Now I get confused because sometimes I feel like her idea of in British English culture is just the Oxbridge idea. And, and therefore, perhaps she doesn't understand that England isn't just made up of the home counties, <laughs> um, and that there are plenty of other places within England that have suffered as a consequence of the power of, like, you know, the royal family in London and the um, home county-centred ideals of the middle class. But I guess if she acknowledges that, it doesn't then... It, it renders her argument invalid. But then maybe she should make a better argument. It's a fine book. I can see why people like it. It ends in a fine way. I feel like everything was so slow at the start, and then all of a sudden the conflict happened right in, like, the last 50 pages, if that. And, it, and the conflict happened, and then it was like everyone was upset about the conflict, and so nothing happened, and then it got dealt with like that very quickly, very easily, and um, I think that's just sloppy writing, <laughs> or at least somebody who can't control their own uh, sort of pacing and narrative. Um, but it's a debut novel, and I think a lot of debut novelists do make that uh, mistake, as I'm sure that I have done in my writing many times. I'm glad I finished it, and um, I probably won't read another book by her. It hasn't compelled me to pick up any more of this kind of novel, um, which I know exists out there, and I'm just so, gutted <laughs> that it had nothing really to do with Hong Kong. Like it just, she never left Hong Kong Island. And Hong Kong is so much bigger than just that. I oh, actually no, she went to Lanar Island once and barely talked about it. But, but for the most part, she never left Hong Kong Island. And even, even on Hong Kong Island, she never left um, the space of like four metro stations. So it was a very small circle. Um, and then she wonders why everything's so expensive. It's like, well, you're in the most expensive part of Hong Kong. Maybe take a train to somewhere else. <laughs> you might discover some new things. You might be able to open your mind for once. Um, three stars, I think, is a good, fine read. It's probably a lower side of three stars, because you know you can have a good three stars and a meh three stars. It's a meh three stars, because it's not quite a two-star read. It wasn't that terrible. It wasn't painful. So, um, yeah, I guess this was a, quite a failed attempt at whatever I wanted to do to this. But maybe I should do something to just talk about my time in Hong Kong. Maybe I can find a way to make it bookish. We shall see. So I'll see you again soon with another video, I'm sure. Bye bye.